Okay, so uh, let's continue our discussion now about uh, controlled fusion. And, uh, of course, I, I should mention what is uncontrolled fusion. Uh, that's, of course, called the hydrogen bomb, which is DT fusion. But really, uh, what we're interested in is how we might be able to make an energy source out of it. As we mentioned here at the bottom of this uh, transparency what we were, or slide, what we were saying was that particles travel uh, about 10 to the 6th meters per second, 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4, uh, sorry, 10 to the 3 kilometers per second, 1,000 kilometers a second. And so uh, it turns out we can estimate that we probably would like to have some form of, of plasma confinement. So uh, there's two types of uh, confinement that one gets into. And we're actually going to talk quite a lot about effectively magnetic confinement and sometimes inertial confinement here in the course, so I won't go into this in too much detail at the moment. But the first type is that, well, let me start out with inertial first. I usually start with magnetic, but let me start with inertial. Inertial confinement, uh, uh, I think you almost ought to use put inertial confinement in parentheses because what it really means is uh, effectively have an explosion and get it over with quick. And inertia, the fact that the particles just don't move too fast, is, is what confines them. They just can't get out of there quick enough. Well, for this, what you end up doing uh, for a plasma or for inertial confinement fusion is that you still need this ion temperature 10 kilovolts, okay? And you still got these particles moving at 10 to the 6 centimeters per second. What you do, though, is you take and you um, have a laser beam or uh, ion beam or something like that, and you inject, um, it turns out, on the order of, of five, or, well, let's say ten megajoules of energy in a very big laser into a poor little target that you ought to feel sorry for because it's going to absorb all that ten megajoules of energy. Uh, by the way, a good measure, unit of measure, although, well, comical one, is that one megajoule is the amount of caloric energy in one jelly donut. But in any case, uh, you take this 10 megajoules of energy, which is bigger than the largest lasers presently available, which are about 100 kilojoules, it turned up to 100 kilojoules. And the idea is you uh, take this laser and you compress a pellet. The pellet is, is on the order of uh, about a tenth of a centimeter uh, in size millimeter style pellet, and you actually compress, uh, you actually have to make the laser come from all directions, and you compress the pellet of DT and some other stuff, um, you compress that pellet to a thousand times solid density, and so you end up with then a, a density of around 10 to the 20, I'm uh, sorry, 10 to the 32 per meter cubed. And this is, is, is on the order of 1,000 times solid density. So uh, like a deuterium liquid or something like that, and then you compress it 1,000 times. Um, and then since our particles were moving 10 to the, um, whatever, uh, uh, 10 to the 6 meters a second, it turns out that the interaction is over with in something of the order of 10, a nanosecond. I think it's 10 nanoseconds, actually, about 10, 10 to the minus 8 uh, seconds. And so you apply this uh, laser, you compress it, and you heat up a plasma, heat up the medium because you put in so much energy into such a small uh, target. Uh, you, you heat it up to this 10 kilovolts. Uh, and then uh, shortly thereafter, of course, you get this basically a DT explosion. The reason why it might be a reasonable energy source is because while it is an explosion, it's nowhere near the hydrogen bomb scale of explosion. The impulse, if you try to make a fusion reactor out of it, you then put a, a containment vessel around it, and the net impulse of this explosion on the wall is, as one unit of measure, roughly equivalent to a car running into a brick wall at 60 miles an hour. And you can imagine that under those conditions, you can approximately have the wall survive, uh, just roughly the net Im impulse on the walls from such an explosion. And you have neutrons come out, and they would 
uh, for DT situation, and they would uh, go in some surrounding walls, uh, heat up the walls, and then you just uh, run water through it and heat it and, and uh, get steam out. So inertial confinement is very high density, okay, 1,000 times solid density, and then heated up to 10 kilovolts, very high ion temperatures. There, some inertial confinement regimes are really not plasmas, uh, but there's sometimes some trouble with satisfying the condition of many particles in a Debye sphere. The Debye length gets too small, it turns out, and the den because the density is so darn high. Uh, so there's some trouble with satisfying the condition that n lambda Debye cubed is much greater than 1. Uh, maybe you only have 10 particles per Debye cubed or something like that. So then the other type of uh, plasma that gets involved and is much more common. Sorry. Hmm? With the inertial component, are you continually pulsing this one little pellet until you get <laughs> uh, On inertial confinement, yeah, you, the idea is you'll drop in a pellet. Um, it turns out some people's scenario is you drop in a pellet once every or 10 hertz, 1 to 10 hertz, 1 to 10 per second, and then you pulse the laser just, you know, you let it drop down here. Just when it gets just in the right position, then you pulse the laser and zap that particular pellet. So it's somewhat like a, what do you call it, an internal combustion engine. Uh, you, but you have to have a new pellet each time because I used up the fuel more or less in that one, one pellet. How do these lasers take the shock of getting Oh, well, you comment? hope that this hole's kind of small. And it's a well-focused laser. <laughs> uh, or alternatively, you put mirrors in and, and bend it, and then maybe the mirror has to take the shock. And the real mirror for it, you put way out here someplace um, so that it does not take the shock. And you just have a window here. But then that window has to take the shock. Yeah? Well, what, what's the pellet? What's the pellet? Yeah. Well, uh, turns out uh, exactly what a pellet is is classified. But more or less, and, and there are two, two, two different types. Roughly, it's just a deuterium-tritium sphere, okay, liquid deuterium and tritium. But then people, since they're trying to compress them and actually decide for other reasons that they put this on a shell, so it's like a bubble, okay, with, with only the deuterium and tritium on the shell. And even people have little styrofoam, I don't know what to call them, BBs or bubbles or something, and you just coat it with deuterium, frozen deuterium and tritium on the shell, or solid deuterium and tritium. Um, so that's the, the general idea there. Let's just put it that way. It's uh, exotic technology, let's just say. <laughs> okay, um, and the pellets can be a little bit bigger than that. Magnetic confinement. Uh, since, you know, these particles want to go so darn far, so darn fast, why don't we uh, do a little bit about trying to confine them? So if I have a magnetic field, uh, what you try to do is, uh, you know, that a magnetic field will cause a charged particle to gyrate around it, so-called Larmor orbits, and we'll be back into this subject uh, soon. And uh, you can easily get, as we'll talk about, um, Larmor radii of the order of centimeters. And so even though the particles have uh, perpendicularly uh, a, a, a large velocity, this 10 to 6 meters a second, uh, pragmatically they don't go but a centimeter or so. Now, the only problem there is that that's great for perpendicular to the magnetic field, but parallel to the magnetic field, you still got them running out the ends. So there's so-called open-ended confinement schemes, and they're, uh, or magnetic mirrors, and we'll talk about these in detail later. And so what you do is you arrange the magnetic field lines to be, um, to be mirrored, to get bigger put magnets at the ends is the idea. And so you, you put magnetic mirrors at the ends and the individual field lines then have to get in between or, or inside of that magnetic mirror. Um, and those have been popular for a while, but now mostly people are going to toroidal systems. And this is roughly in the shape of a donut. And so uh, the idea is that, um, let me draw what's called a tokamak. Uh, just in cross-section, uh, there's a, okay, 
I'm only drawing half of it. But the basic idea is that you, you have field lines in this direction, you follow them around, and they come back and bite their tail, roughly speaking. Uh, and when they come back and bite their tail, um, then you don't lose them. So particles gyrate around, and then they go uh, toroidally and come back to themselves. Okay, um, so basically we'll end up talking a fair amount about all of these subjects about uh, um, controlled fusion, particularly the magnetic confinement things, so I won't uh, dwell upon them at this point. So I want to mention a few more, um, uh, few more applications here. Um, so an application is, uh, let's call it modern astrophysics. Um, the sun is, after all, a, a stellar body, and it's, uh, um, uh, it's certainly a plasma, it turns out. So the stars, um, interstellar media, um, it turns out interstellar media have only about one particle per cubic centimeter. Um, but nonetheless, it's uh, temperatures on the order of tens to hundreds of EV. And Crab Nebula, well, it's things like that, large scale, very large scale. Uh, galaxies and so forth, and they have very definitely uh, collective interactions. Um, then, uh, so there's all kinds of modern astrophysical applications, let me say. Uh, another one is uh, MHD energy conversion. And here what one has in mind is, uh, and actually this has been to some degree uh, demonstrated, is suppose I have just two plates here and I arrange to have a magnetic field uh, into the paper at that point or into the uh, monitor here. And suppose I have a, a hot plasma which I has, has some velocity in this direction. Then uh, what happens is that uh, the ions uh, get a V cross B, a Lorentz force, E, V cross B upward, so for ions, whereas the electrons see a downward force, minus V cross B electrons. And so you get this, these plates charge up, and this is a, a means by which you could produce net, uh, net electrical power just by flowing a medium through, or throw, flowing a plasma, it has to be a charged plasma, it turns out, uh, through a magnetic field, and the V cross B causes the two, two types of particles to separate, hence you get this electrical uh, charge, which you can take advantage of, you can draw current off of it, basically. Uh, and this would have the advantage that it would not be subject to the usual thermodynamic uh, efficiency arguments, where you know, because of the Carnot efficiency and you, you can only run materials up to 1,000 degrees C or so and that limits your Carnot efficiency and your typical thermodynamic uh, cycle efficiencies uh, to power plants up to about 40%. In principle, you can use this for a so-called topping cycle. Uh, you have uh, hot, uh, say, uh, uh, gases coming out of a coal-fired furnace. You seed them with something which causes it to become a little bit charged, cesium or something like that. Um, and you can get uh, higher efficiency for the hotter gases as they first come out. Then you put it into a turbine over here. The only trouble is all this little seeding that you put in has to come back. It's expensive stuff. You have to bring it back over here, and this is kind of dirty coal coming up, and so it's not the easiest thing to actually do. But people have actually done this MHT energy conversion. Um, the contrary of this is called uh, ion propulsion, or it should be called plasma propulsion, truthfully. What is MHD for? Oh, sorry, magnetohydrodynamics. MHD is magnetohydrodynamics. We'll use that terminology more um, later. So ion plasma propulsion, uh, the basic idea is you just have two plates and you have um, some plasma in between. Um, and uh, again, you arrange to have a magnetic field across or, or in the, into the board. But this time you have a, a generator, okay, which, uh, which causes a current to flow in this direction across. And that plasma comes out the back of the device, uh, as in a uh, propulsion device, uh, 
there's a J cross B force on the plasma, which causes the plasma to be lost uh, from the system. So uh, now, by the way, why wouldn't you do this on a single particle basis? You know, I'll just eject an ion. Well, that's great. You know, I inject and I, I eject an ion and get a little bit of an impulse. But the problem is, I'd like to have an awful lot of ions doing this, right? If I have an awful lot of ions, I, if I eject a whole lot of ions to get a whole lot of momentum, then I would charge up this uh, the, the spacecraft basically. If I got them away from the spacecraft, and then I'd pull back all the electrons. Okay, so you get into a plasma. Uh, you want to eject a plasma because that's quasi-neutral and you don't cause yourself to, to build up. Well, anyway, briefly then some other applications are solid-state plasmas, the, um, um, the so-called free electrons and uh, um, charge and holes in a, in a solid-state medium. Uh, both actually have this property. Um, gas lasers, uh, you know, helium-neon lasers, uh, CO2 lasers, things like that. They all um, ionize, or ionize gases where you ionize the gas to invert some of the charge states. Uh, free electron lasers use a lot of the same mathematics that we use, non-neutral plasmas, uh, where you try to, uh, in electromagnetic fields, contain uh, positrons and things like that. So in general, what we want to say out of this is it turns out that plasmas uh, constitute... Uh, some people have estimated on the order of 99% of the universe, and we're just kind of an anomaly that live in the odd 1%, uh, and plasmas actually uh, are, in, are most of what the universe is composed of. And they go from densities of the order of 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 34th per meter cubed, the odd 28 orders of magnitude in density. Uh, so they're pretty broad range. And in temperatures between something like 0.1 eV and 10 to the 6 eV. So the idea is plasmas are pretty ubiquitous in the universe. Um, we just happen to live on Earth and uh, have this uh, rather unusual um, uh, environment which doesn't have too many plasmas. But as far as the universe is concerned, it's the more normal mode of operation or no more normal state in which most of the universe lives. Next time we'll go on and start talking about charged particle orbits Chapter 2 in Chen and Bittencourt both, actually.